Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a beautiful day here, a little cold, but uh, sun shining and uh, well, pleasant uh, to be outside later in the afternoon, probably. I'd like to talk a little bit this morning about uh, repairing turnings. I've seen lots of people just throw a turning away, and especially for spindle turning, like trying to make four legs for a table. And they just keep going through billet after billet after billet to get four that look alike. And we'll do another session sometime on tricks of duplication, but you can very often fix a turning, whether it be a spindle turning or a faceplate turning. And in the end, you're about the only one that will really know that it happened. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what we can do if things don't go as well as they should. The first thing is that if you take any turning, and I'm gonna switch cameras here, you, if you set this vertically on a tabletop, and you set another one like it, the most important thing is not so much these major diameters and minor diameters, it's where these elements lie on the spindle. If they're the same height from either end of the spindle, things will look pretty good and people will actually ignore a fair amount of variance in diameter. You could be on a, a, a bobbin, turning like this, and this goes in the bottom of a Windsor chair. The two chairs are gonna be at least a couple of feet apart. So you could be off by an eighth of an inch on the diameter of the bobbin and probably a 16th anywhere up in here, even maybe an eighth, and nobody would see the difference. Because the unwritten assignment to the viewer when they view something like balusters in a spindle legs on a chair is to make these things look alike. Human beings are not symmetrical left to right. Most people have one hip lower than the other. We are, our face is often different on one side or the other. My ears stick way out. Uh, you get the idea, but we tend to blend that out and see things as symmetrical. So a fair amount of trump oi or trick of the eye is involved here as well. If things like, if you got this little half bead in this bobbin here wrong and, and you screwed it up, you're trying to do it with a skew and you got a big line, you could turn that a little smaller. You could even move where it is in oh, a sixteenth of an inch. Nobody's gonna notice. But there are times when things go pretty badly wrong. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Let's just get a skew chisel out here. And be turning down through here, nice turning. And, oh, got away from me, darn. First time I ever did that. And I got a big divot here. Well, I could turn that smaller, but by the time I turn that all away, uh, it will be, uh, it, the whole bobbin would have to be a lot smaller or the walls here would have to be a lot steeper. So it makes more sense to fix a defect like that. So to do that, we'll lock our spindle. We'll grab a shoulder rabbit plane and now if you're making something this hopefully you have some pieces of wood around from the spindle and you can find one. So you wanna line the grain up in the same direction. That's about right. P 
This could be a little longer. Well, that's good enough for now. So we're gonna get out a pretty good fix it for a lot of things in turning and that is sinoacrylator super glue. And we're gonna put a little of that right on that spot right there like that. And we're gonna take this on, on the good side of it here that's plain smooth. I'm gonna spray some accelerator and And then this is medium viscosity super glue. It comes in three viscosities, water thin, medium, and thick. I never use the thick. It, it tends to go bad in the bottle before I can use it. And uh, I actually use five minute epoxy uh, more effectively, I think, but I'll talk about that more in a little while. But at any rate, I now have this stuck there. I'll unlock my spindle and I'm gonna move this back out of the way so that clears. I'll put some speed on this. This is the interrupted cut of interrupted cuts. Of course, you would actually take a back saw and cut most of that away, but when I'm doing one of these things, I like to show off a little. Now we'll go back to this skew chisel. Get a little higher here. Now I purposely used a completely different species of wood to show you the effect, but uh, it's right here and I pretty much can't find it. There's where it didn't quite big enough to patch everything there, but it, it covered it over. And this will work too, is you often break a bead for one reason or other uh, through mishap, through slipping, through any number of things. And it's easy to glue a piece in a bead and, and fix it that way. The other type of spindle turning fix is often on big architectural turnings like architectural newel posts and things like that. Uh, you uh, will be turning like in a, there's 10 newel posts in a, a stair railing in our, uh, our bedroom uh, at the house that I turned in 2000, 2001, something like that. And I was turning one of these big baluster beads on the top of it, uh, supposedly uh, lawn balls were um, copied from, but at any rate, big catch with a spindle gouge right in the top, big hole there. I took about a three quarter inch bit brace. It just drilled right down the center of that defect, drilled it right out of there. And then I, put a piece of wood between centers, but in such a way that I had 
the same grain as I had there, which was a little off of end grain. It was just slightly, and it was the same material. And I turned that to the diameter of that hole, put some glue in it, pounded it in there, put it back in the lathe and turned it off level. And today I, I was gonna take a picture of it with my iPhone this morning, I couldn't even find it. So uh, you can do some very effective repairs that way. Also, I have a number of times over the years been asked to repair some valuable antiques where some turning it is badly damaged. Uh, and I always try to replace as little as I can. One that comes to mind was a finial that was coming down off the bottom of a piece of furniture. It was a hanging pendant really. And the end was broken off. I steamed the high glue, took it off, uh, jam chucked it till it was running true, drilled out the end very minorly, glued another piece of walnut in there and turned uh, it to look like the rest of them. I then antiqued the piece a little to make it look the same color. And when I was done, it was hard to tell, but we had not completely replaced the turning. We'd kept as much as possible. So uh, these techniques are good. And again, uh, nobody's going to go down there. And, and if you do have a little round patch there that you, you can see, you can just turn a, a chair leg to the bottom, to the floor, some direction that isn't seen very much. Any questions? Take Ernie, a look at Ernie, yeah. I have one minor question. Sure. Um, with your cyano glues, and I use them too, uh, do you keep them refrigerated? I do not, um, cause, because I use them fairly regularly, but I have found actually you tend to get more moisture in the glue and ruin it faster by the constant heating and cooling of it because it, it picks up moisture and water will cure cyanoacrylate. Uh, there is a definite life to cyanoacrylate. On open bottles, you can keep a lot longer by keeping them in a refrigerator, so I'm told. Uh, I usually try not to buy more than I can use. And there comes a time when you do a demonstration like this and you spray it and catalyze it and everything, and it just falls right back off. The glue has gone bad. So buying it fresh, and a lot of clubs will get group buys on it and everybody buys uh, kind of like the person at the smorgasbord that comes up with a, a plate about this big to the table and they can only eat a plate this big. Uh, so keep that in mind when you buy uh, cyanoacrylate glue. Any other, any other questions? Um, also in this type of a repair in the shop, I would tend to use just a plain cold glue or even hide glue and simply let it dry long enough for the repair to really be stuck there. And that uh, I think the longevity of the repair may be better with these types of glue or hide glue than it is with cyanoacrylate. But it's sure fun to do demos with it because it dries so quickly. Uh, a common problem in a bowl is that you're turning along and you find big defects in it. Here's a really nice maple burl uh, that uh, I turned a long time ago, but I didn't date. Uh, but it is a really beautiful piece, but it actually had holes that went all the way through it. Let me come in on the other camera. So this hole goes all the way through the piece, as does this one actually, the very center of this comes through to that side. And uh, for these types, here's another one in the rim. For these types of repairs, I, much prefer 
epoxy resin, I usually for this purpose use five minute. And here's a, a bowl that would be, I've been keeping screws in this bowl because it got, it had a, a, a punky piece in here that broke up off slightly after I turned it. And so this is a candidate for this technique. So I get plain old five minute epoxy and my favorite source for it has become Dollar General where you can buy this for a buck and a half a tube and it's a, a very small amount but it's generally enough for most shop and household tasks and the price is right. And I like it because you get a perfect mixture out of these tubes. It has adult proof packaging, however. So whenever I'm working with these types of products, uh, even super glue, but especially epoxies, I will put on these kinds of gloves because about the only way you can get this stuff off your hands is with lacquer thinner and putting lacquer thinner on your hands isn't really a desirable thing. And I'll actually use the little gizmo right here to mix it in. You're kind of out of focus, Ernie. I don't. That should be in. That's in pretty good focus right there. It's fuzzy to me. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and. I'm just going to squirt some of this out into the tray like that. And this is some lamp black. In 2007, I was part of the uh, 18th century furniture conference at Williamsburg, and we were reproducing a finish that was used in the 1600s that was essentially uh, uh, pine tree sap mixed with lamp black. And Jay Hedden, who was head of the program down there at that time said, well, don't go buy any. I got a whole bunch I got for something one time. And he sent me a huge plastic baggie inside of another huge plastic baggie with about a pound of this stuff. And I spilled more of it than I've used, but it, it doesn't take much of this to do the job. And I can simply take this now and spread that on there. With a palette knife and if you have a hole all the way through a bowl, a good trick is to put a piece of masking tape on one side of it and then fill it from the other side and hold it in such a way that it stays there. And with five minutes, as it starts to firm up, you can actually kind of sculpture it around like, as I'm doing. Now, five minute epoxy gets firm in five minutes, but it really isn't hardened. So uh, you can go back to work on this sometimes in 15, 20 minutes, but you're really better to wait like 12 hours before you do much with it. So that is another patch here that I've, I've found to be pretty darn effective. Any questions? Yeah, Ernie, I got one. I've never tried this kind of stuff. Uh, 
but uh, have you ever tried any other tents, for instance, a tent that, uh, like, let's say, sawdust or something, and I don't know what you'd use uh, to try to, uh, try to match the, the bowl wood? The, the more artistic people are using all kinds of different ground colors to do this. Um, but uh, I have not, I have not tried other than the shavings I'm working with. But again, uh, a fairly effective patch can make, uh, uh, can be made by adding the wood dust, but it needs to be dust that you find up like around the banjo and places like that and not chips or shavings. If you do ch chips or sh shavings and you fill a hole with it, it looks like it's got particle board in the patch. Uh, so the, the, the trick here is to have fine enough dust, if you will. Let me get my other camera to go live. Now, another option when you come to these kind of problems in attorney is to live with the problem and, and make it a feature. And this was a beautiful maple or cherry burl that I was turning in 1991. No, it's a Douglas fir burl. And, uh, it had a big dead knot that fell out. And I said, well, you know, it kind of shows that I got a very even wall thickness here. And uh, so it, you know, just becomes part of it and it becomes art and not a utilitarian bowl. Uh, so again, doing nothing is sometimes a good idea. Here's another piece I was turning at a club demonstration in 2000, and it had a big chainsaw nick in it. When I started, to, you know, they handed this as the stuff I was working with to me. And as I turned it, I said, ah, we'll probably turn that away, no problem. The more I turned, the bit deeper it was. It was a plunge cut right into the uh, bowl. So I took it home with me and I thought, well, you know, there's some art here. So I fabricated a, a piece of wood that looks like a chainsaw bar and I took ground a scratch beater and scratched a bead or a, a, a groove in it and I took a piece of chainsaw chain and I ground this all out like a cutaway and made it into art <laughs> so it sits Ernie, there like that Ernie, yep you're, you, you are out of focus all right there it did focus. It's We're on the focus. It's on the center of the spindle. So it's <laughs> well, for what it's worth, Ernie, for some reason, you're in very good focus here in Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. Yeah. Here in, in, here in Moreland Hills, you're in focus too, huh, Ernie? Ernie? Um, I'm across the driveway and you're not in focus. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's the, uh, the possibilities that you have there. Other uh, repairs, of course, are to glue pieces of wood in. We've already talked about that. There's actually advertisements in the 1700s in major cities for people that would repair wood bowls. And uh, they would, in those days, glues weren't as effective as today. And they would uh, drill holes if the bowl checked and uh, weave silver wire around the defect. How you would clean this and keep the germs out of it, I don't know, but <laughs> they did this. <laughs> and uh, it was a common practice. And that is uh, another thing in bowl turning uh, that I'll mention is repair on the fly as you go, uh, we all 
pretty much turn green wood to start with. And this is a bowl that I turned in 09, blanked out. And uh, as I watched it start to dry, I could see that there was going to be a pretty good defect here. I'm pretty close to the center of the tree here. And uh, so I hit all of these little spots with water thin super glue. And is, yeah, this is a pretty decent focus there. Um, and then to give you an idea of the difference in viscosity here, but with the thin, it is water thin. And when you put it on these little checks, it will just go right down in there to the base of it. You let that sit for a few minutes and then you go to the medium, which is, as you can see, quite a bit thicker. It's more like maple syrup. So I usually glue the checks, let it sit for five, 10 minutes, and then put the medium on. And again, I do not use the thick because a $10 bottle of thick will go bad before I ever can uh, 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 get the job done, use it up. There. Uh, any questions on any of this that we've covered? All right, uh, the big message here is not to uh, uh, give up on a turdy, that there is usually something you can do to repair it. And these techniques are valuable because if you're doing really nice furniture where say you have four legs that were all cut from the same billet of wood and you want everything to match, I think that uh, repair makes a lot of sense rather than getting a completely different piece of and color of wood uh, for the fourth leg. It'll look like the odd man out. Uh, other than that, that is kind of the repair techniques here. Um, there is a video on our YouTube channel, I think, I'll make sure it's on there, which I did for actually tight bond glue, and it is on repair techniques. And uh, that could be some further watching because I, I actually do more of this uh, on the lathe and with close-ups. Of course, it took me a day or so to make that video, so it was a lot more time involved. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, the fourth or third edition of the lathe book is out and we do sell this on our website at cheaper than Amazon. And someday the post office will probably get it to you. Uh, any other questions we have today? I have a comment. Yes. We've got enough time. There's that three minute video we put together yesterday. Yeah, that would be kind of fun and, and I'll, have to share my screen for that one, but um, we we have in 1975 approximately. I planted uh, oh like 50 Colorado blue spruce trees on the property that I got from Munzer Forest over in uh, your, your thing. Went yep, on. yep. Uh, that we. Uh, uh, have let grown. And when we moved our house, uh, what, 35 years ago, Susan? I don't know. A long time ago. Uh, we dug up some of these and planted them in groups of three around the house and they've gone up to pretty good size. And it's gotten to where three of them were leaning towards the house. One actually fell down in a windstorm and just missed the house. And, uh, so we decided we had to take two of them down. And one of them was the most difficult tree I have ever uh, felled. Uh, it was 
cricket is a dog's hind leg and leaning significantly towards the house and it, 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 gravity would dictate you'd pretty well hit the house when you cut it down. So after thinking about it for like five weeks, we finally did it uh, Thursday afternoon. Yeah. So this is the tree and in the left is the corner of our bedroom. And you can see that not only is it leaning towards the bedroom, it has this like extra top that comes out. That's a 14 inch diameter trunk. Okay. So about an inch and a half to two inches is your hinge. So the second cut, I took and made a bore cut all the way across here yeah. without cutting this out. Mm -hmm. Then I, I walked that cut in and I had to come around to this side and bring it up this so that I had two inches on each side. I made that a little bigger than it needed to be. Then I came back here and bore cut in here and that's where I placed the wedge. And then I cut this back strap. This is called the back strap here. And then I walked over and cut this one out and I heard it start to creak. Then I started whacking it with a hammer. Yeah. Modern felling differs a lot from like when Bruce and I were Boy Scouts. Uh, we learned that you cut the notch in the tree and then you just cut in from the back of the tree over about two inches above the, the V or notch you put in there. And uh, about three years ago, four years ago, Justin and I took uh, a tree felling course that Husqvarna puts on at the annual Paul Bunyan show here in Ohio. And uh, boy, did we learn a lot. I, I wouldn't have tried this without that course under my belt, but the modern method is to bore cut sideways through the tree after you cut the notch and establish the hinge, then go around and cut in from the back, the second bore cut, and then cut these two back straps that are left away. And by doing that, you take all the tension wood out of the center, because especially if a tree is on a hillside like this, you will have tension wood here and compression wood here. And if you were gonna fall, fell it uphill, you'd cut your notch. And the minute you start cutting through here, it would just split right up the center of the tree. It's called barber cherry. And by doing that bore cut first, you eliminate that problem because you relieve all that tension. So it's a, a better technique, but uh, if you've never bore cut before, uh, do it on some logs that are laying down for a while first because it uh, can get away from you. Have somebody show you how to do it. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was fun.
<laughs> I don't think so. I don't think Susan thought it was fun. No, she was uh, in a state of high dungeon. <laughs> I kept asking Ernie, are you sure the tractor and I aren't just going to be like Trevor's shade across the yard and over the tree? <laughs> and he assured me that the rope would break before anything like that would happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that would be like uh, the uh, <laughs> Cadillac Escalade hits the motorbike. <laughs> Yeah. One, we've got a short day today. Yep. Well, uh, it was good seeing everybody. And uh, I can leave the channel open for a few minutes if anybody wants to talk. And uh, uh, I don't know, for next time, maybe duplication might be the subject. Are people interested in that? I would be. Yes. Yes. Me too. All right. Well, I, I always joke at turning symposiums that a lot of the art turners <laughs> brag that they've never turned two things alike. And I always quip that it's because they can't. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it, I think even if you're an art turner, being able to turn the shape you really envision and really want and can do it twice is important. So we will talk about duplication. <laughs>